and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from uh, sunny San Diego. And actually today I'm joined by Julie Thomas, who is also in San Diego. How are you doing, Julie? Absolutely fabulous. Thanks, John. And yes, it is sunny out there today. Yeah. Shocking. And for those people, yeah, and for those people, <laughs> uh, for those people who don't believe us and like all that is we've had a pretty terrible summer so far and i know the sympathy out there is massive from every <laughs> other part of the country everyone's going oh sorry for that sorry yeah. your perfect weather didn't hang around for one year <laughs> <laughs> and so julie julie works with revenue leaders across industries to help them realize results they never thought possible She's president and ceo of value selling associates um, you began your sales career with Gartner Group. Uh, you were the vice president of Gartner Sales Training for the Americas. And in 2003, you joined Value Selling Associates as chief executive officer and president. And the company's become market leader in competency and process-based training for escalating sales performance in B2B sales organizations. Okay, so and today we're going to talk about your revenue engine unleashed. So maybe uh, diving straight in, Julie, what, what, when you talk about a revenue engine, explain that phrase. Well, the responsibility for revenue is no longer solely with the sales organization. Mm -hmm. It is an engine, if you will, from finding and attracting your ideal customers to engaging them, to selling to them, to in this as a service world, retaining them and expanding that relationship over time to build advocates and repeat customers over time. So sales has expanded. And so our position is, if you talk to a customer, any role that you have in an organization, you have to be part of the revenue engine because you're part of the customer experience. Yeah, no, and I think that's that's a perfect explanation. I totally agree with you because uh, the customer experience today it starts with however they interact with your brand for the first time, whether it's your website, whether it's through marketing, whether it's through LinkedIn, whatever, whatever that is, all the way through to, um, you know, as a customer and how, how you service them and all of that kind of stuff. And any anything that anything that breaks that chain or any inconsistent experience in that chain undermines everything. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the whole concept of, of what we hear now is people are looking for that frictionless <laughs> experience, which means it's easy, right? Yeah. That the handoffs are seamless, that I don't have to repeat myself a hundred different times just because I'm getting escalated or moved from one professional to the other based on what my needs are at that time. So, you know, it's it's making it easy and then it's making sure that everybody is kind of approaching the customer with the same framework or playbook. Um, one of my colleagues last week gave a presentation and I thought her analogy was beautiful. She talked about American football, which just started here last week mm -hmm. and talked about, hey, at some point at the end of the season, there's going to be a Pro Bowl and you're going to get all these great players from different teams that come together and they play a game together. But the game usually stinks. Yeah. because it's just about top talent. They're not working together. They're not communicating. They're not on the same page. They're not working from the same playbook. So the Pro Bowl is a very different experience than the Super Bowl or a, a football dynasty, a team that mm -hmm. has a, a track record of winning where they're in a system and they're working collectively towards the same outcome. Mm -hmm. No, I, that, that's a that's a great actually that's a great analogy. I never thought about that, but yeah, you're right. Uh, everybody shows up to the Pro Bowl to showboat, really. So nobody's really working together. Uh, but it is it is fascinating because I think this is a transition that a lot of companies are still struggling with. I mean, they kind of get like that, you know, that the that sales is no longer discreet. You know, that it that marketing, sales, support, all of that stuff bleed into each other. But I'm not sure or whether many have actually um, systematized it, if you like. I think they struggle with that because they struggle thinking that, that a sales process has finite definitive stages. So you own this part, you own 100% of that part, then you're going to throw it over the transom and I own the next part and I own 100% of that next part and then it might move into somebody else. But the reality is the buying journey is not linear. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. It's not that defined. So it it gets murky. It gets confusing. And for the seller who's trying to be rigid in their process, well, I already did a demo. So now we're doing the next thing or, Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it just doesn't work that way. So you have to define process. No question. You got to know where you're at and where you're going, but you also need to have enough flexibility in your engagement strategies that you can flex to the buyer's journey, the buyer's process, their requirements, and not just be ticking off your boxes of here's what I need to do next. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely. And, and when you work with organizations, I'm just fascinated about this is that here we are 2023, or it's, it's going to be over soon, which is just ridiculous in itself. But, um, but here we are in 2023. And we're still discussing sales marketing alignment and all of that. So when you work with companies, uh, you know, how do you address that? Because that's like this issue that we should not be dealing with anymore, but we still are. And as you said, some people still um, adhere to that old adage of, you know, good fences make good neighbors. And uh, that's why, you know, they're all demarked and I'll do this part. And if I do my part, pass it over, then you need to do. So how do you work with those organizations who still haven't got that alignment going? Well, the challenge is always the people, right? Yeah. The, you know, if you've got a CSO and a CMO, they're like, well, I'm not going to report to him and I'm not going to report to yeah. her. And so I think it's I think it's an evolution that's that's happening. But you can't just kind of wave a, a magic wand and change people mm-hmm. and change processes. Um, right. The the revolution doesn't work. So um I think part of it is getting the buy-in and the hearts of the mind of the people in those roles. And it probably means that we've got to start changing how we measure the efficacy of those roles. Mm -hmm. It's amazing if we start to change the measurements and the KPIs and set the different expectations, we'll start to see different collaborative working environments, I believe. So you've got that mismatch of, well, we've always measured it this way. We've always done it that way. We want to change, but we haven't changed the things around the people to make it easy for them to change. Yeah, and I think I think that's a very powerful point, actually, because just thinking about it is that uh, we haven't evolved even people's expectations of their jobs or their job descriptions or anything like that, you know. And and so it's it's not it's not uh, it's not unreasonable for some people to think that they should operate in, in a traditional manner because we have never really defined what their evolving role should be. No, and, and, and sales was one area that we could do it really well. Here's your quota, Julie, go sell, <laughs> you know, a million dollars of stuff and, mm-hmm. and you'll be successful. And the VP of sales owned, okay, if I have 10 Julies, I have a $10 million quota. And and it became very easy to measure. It's very mm-hmm. easy to measure sales, either it's happening or it's not. Um, it's the other things that become the leading indicators that put Julie in a position to deliver on the revenue number that are harder to measure and harder to correlate to those results. The good news is we've got a lot of data right now. The bad news is mm-hmm. we have a lot of data right now that we don't <laughs> know what to do with and turn into actionable decision-making insights. But that's, again, I mean, a great point you just made there, because I think leading indicators, you're right, is that a lot of people don't know how to find them, how to measure them. Lagging indicators are always very easy. That's great. Here's what we did last month. Trouble with lagging indicators, yeah, um, necessary, and they give you information and whatever, but you can't influence them. You can't influence something in the past. So it's the leading indicators. And they do. And here's the thing, I think, Julie, is I think sometimes people think that leading indicators or anything you measure needs to be something complex or whatever. When I when I worked with with Huthwaite, I mean, one of the leading indicators we were going is like, are you doing call planning, right? That's a leading indicator. If you're doing, if you're doing call planning, then you know that you will, you know, that there, something will come from that. So that exercise. So they don't have to be that complicated. You just have to know that there are things you can do that can influence outcomes. No, I think, but I think you've said something really powerful there. And in today's world where there's so much automation and now you've got mm-hmm. AI and you've got yeah. all these different things that are bombarding the sales organization, um, it is very easy for things to get complicated. I've seen companies with dashboards 
that I, I mean, they're just on one hand, they're, they're they're kind of fascinating. On the other hand, they're so complicated. There's nothing actionable that comes out of that. Yeah. And I think a leader's job is to reduce complexity and the mm-hmm. elegance and sophistication comes in the simplicity of the execution. Yeah. Buying is hard. We have to make selling easier yes. for the reps. And I think we've now, we have gotten in our own way in a lot of cases, good intentions, but unintended negative uh, consequences on productivity and effectiveness. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I'm a, I'm, I, I'm a big believer. I say that all the time, like, you know, because people talk about big data and more data and all of that. And I say, it's not big data or more data, it's relevant data. And that can be a very small subset of data that's actually more relevant to your business and all this other stuff is. So, yeah, I think I think uh, we have to be careful that we don't get into suddenly just because we can measure everything, that everything everything is a KPI because it's not. I agree. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, so so tell me a little bit about some of the organizations. You don't know, name them, but ones that you've worked with. And uh, Can you talk me through a little bit of the transition and maybe the surprises that they maybe had? They were surprised when things started to change for the positive and what those surprises were. So our typical client is a B2B sales organization selling something that is often as much a business decision as Mm -hmm. it is a procurement decision. So there's typically executive involvement or at least mid-level management involvement in that decision. It's not just a procurement driven, I'm buying paper or pencils or something like that. Um, And so our, 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 many of our clients come to us because they don't understand, their sales teams don't understand what this whole value comp- value is. And they think that if I train them on what the value proposition is, they'll yep. be able to go execute that in their, their clients. And, and they don't. So I think one of the first surprises that many people have is that no matter what you're selling, you could be selling the most technical SaaS based, you know, big ticket solution, or you could be selling, you know, paper, paper products for hotels and hospitals. Um, What they find is the key to the conversation isn't about your product. It's about the conversation about your customer what's going on in your their business and how you're going to impact it. And that sounds probably very common sense, common mm-hmm. approach, but 90% of sales reps are never trained on how to have a business conversation. They're just trained how to show up and be demo dollies <laughs> for their products and services. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean that with great respect. Sure. Of course, we need to talk about our products and educate our prospects on it, yeah. but they never develop the context to make their product relevant. Yeah. Um, and I think that is the biggest kind of surprise. It's not rocket science. It's not earth shattering, but it's a discipline that high performing sales reps develop. Yeah, no, absolutely. I have any two comments to that. And that one is, as you said, uh, it, it's common sense. But the problem with common sense is it's not that common. Uh, and uh, my second cliche, if I can remember what I was going to say, <laughs> I think I've even forgotten that one now. But yeah, no. Um, oh, yeah, it's 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 simple. But simple doesn't equate to easy. It's amazing. Absolutely how not. It's amazing how you can put common sense, simple things in front of people. But it's all about them adopting and implementing and using it and understanding and stuff. So it may be simple. Doesn't mean it's easy. Absolutely. And there's a huge difference. Simple does also does not mean simplistic. Yeah. Um, so, um, but there's a, a whole group of people out there for whatever reason that have decided if we, if it's not complicated, <laughs> it must not be that good. I mean, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. Because when we complicate the process and confuse a buyer, a confused buyer never makes a decision. No. They just kick the can down the road. And so we have to eliminate the confusion and make it easy for a customer to make a decision. Mm. And and what's really interesting as well is uh, just playing off what you said there about 
you know, having those business conversations and understanding what's going on at the at the customer. Um, this research recently is just it's funny, like coming out of COVID and all of that, is that they said that the main thing that people want is to be seen, heard, and understood. Seen, heard, and understood, as simple as that. And that completely aligns with what you just said earlier because you have to see the person so you have to recognize who they are what they're doing make sure they understand that and listen to them and then validate that you understand what they're saying so if you do that to me if you sort of say oh, okay i understand your role i understand your company and then you listen to me and then you revalidate that you understood what i said to you hey you're on a winner already isn't it powerful so sales is just a communication framework value selling is a communication framework. And it's how to ensure that our prospects do feel seen, heard, and understood, and demonstrate that in how we speak with them. But it, it, it's interesting, Gartner's come out with some, some research recently that said they, they're calling it mentalizing. And it's all the intangible things that give a buyer confidence that they're making the right decision, that mm. they're saying is, the it factor in whether you're winning or losing today. We, we all know that ROI is not enough. Mm -hmm. Things with ROI don't get purchased every day for whatever reason. So it's the mentalizing. Well, we've been teaching that for 20 years. We call it personal value. Right. People buy from people and people are motivated for their reasons. And to the yeah. extent that the sales rep can build enough trust to understand what motivates each individual they're interacting with, they're going to be more effective. Yeah, and and uh, and and just to underline that point, because I, I do think sometimes we forget in in B two B sales, we sometimes we forget that the 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 person or people who are making the buying decision. That's a personal decision on each of their behalfs, not just a company decision. Because let's face it, when you when you purchase something or you're the one responsible for purchasing, it can be career enhancing, it can be career limiting, um, depending on how it works out. So you have a lot, there's a lot of personal stuff invested. And I think sometimes we overlook that. We just think, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're representing the company or they're stonewalling because of this and saying, no, they're not. They're because you haven't, as you pointed out, you haven't dealt with their intrinsic motivation. Absolutely. And everybody's motivated. Yeah. Um, you know, some people are motivated to do less than others, but everybody's got a motivation, right? And so that's an important part of the equation that is often overlooked. AI is not going to replace that. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, that still is going to be the communication, whether it's in an, you know, a, a video meeting like this one is, yeah. or a face-to-face -face meeting. Somehow we make subtle but quick determinations about, do I trust this person? Are they telling yep. me the truth? Do they care about me or do they just care about their own agenda? And it's happening in the gray matter subconsciously through every meeting and interaction you have. Yeah. And, and another point too is, uh, you know, all these tools like automation and AI, they all have their place, right? And for me, their place is to, to right now is to get rid of all the rote and routine work and stuff that um, just gets in the way of relationship building and it's allowing salespeople to work more on the uh, focus more on the relationship aspect. But if you over you if you start overusing these tools and AI and stuff. The one big thing that people are craving, and this again comes from all the research recently, is authenticity, right? And and I don't understand how you can be authentic if you're not building a proper relationship with somebody. You can use all of these tools to help you, but you're not going to build an authentic connection using AI. I'm sorry, you're not. Not now, anyway. No, I don't think so. I mean, AI certainly has a place and yeah. everybody's trying to figure it out and figure out where it fits and what are the ethics around it and all of that yeah. other stuff. But it's not going to replace the salesperson for the types of companies that we yeah. work with. Um, it may replace some of the tasks that they do today, but it's the yeah. tasks they hate anyways. Well, this, um, is, this is it. This is the, this is, this is exactly, I mean, it's like we, we built into, we used AI and built into Pipeliner, uh, an email assistant. So now you've, you know, write your emails for you. You can decide, you know, what tone, all of this, all this stuff. stuff. Great. Most salespeople hate writing emails to begin with. A lot of salespeople aren't very good at writing emails. And we're terrible at editing anyway, yeah. self-editing. So something like that, great time saver, all of that allows you to move on to other things. But for me, that's where the value is right now.
yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. You see, um, you know, there's all this conversational intelligence now saying that they're they're being able to use AI to determine in um, sentiment and engagement. And did you bore him to tears or was he leaning in? And, you know, it, I, I think it's all interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's going to give us insight. Again, the question is, what is actionable insight that makes a difference yeah. versus noise that just gives us so much information that we're paralyzed in the moment. Yeah. And, and, and I think we run the risk. This it's, it, it, it is interesting. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think we run the risk. And because if, if you think oh, all of the, I'm getting all this stuff coming to me, then I don't have to work as hard. Do I, I mean, seriously. And, and that's the day. No, that's the danger that you start to, um, start to become complacent because you think all these uh, capabilities are going to do all this stuff for you. And you maybe start to slacken off. Um, you know, maybe unconsciously. No, I had, I mean, thinking just to that point of wanting to be seen, heard and understood. Mm -hmm. I actually had somebody tell me the other day, the beauty of Zoom and transcription or conversational intelligence is I don't have to listen anymore. <laughs> it's like, because I get the transcript. I'm like, so how does that further the, the relationship and how do you engage in that, in, in advancing that conversation if you're not paying attention? My it's, goodness, it's so crazy, you, but yeah. What are you doing on Zoom then? Are you just like are you checking the sports results or what do you do? I mean, I, that's that's a phenomenal. I have to say that's a phenomenal way of of uh, making sure if a customer figures our prospect figures out that you're not really paying attention or listening or whatever like that. Wow, that, I wonder how successful that person's going to be. I, I'm thinking not very, at least not in this role. There might be yeah. a different role for them. You know, they might be very successful in a different role, but it it, it probably isn't in a customer facing Absolute. role yep. where you do have to demonstrate that you yeah. care. Even if I disagree with you, I have to d demonstrate that I care about you as a customer. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, and and people are getting, um, uh, not to belabor the point, but people are getting more and more um, attuned to figuring out people on virtual calls. Like people are getting more attuned to. Hang on a second, that person is looking at their phone. Hang on, I see their. I heard that ding, and I saw them immediately glance away, and their hand went out of picture yeah. where they're typing. <laughs> so I just think we're we're all attuned to it now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So listen, Julie, this has been fantastic, right? The time has flown. Um, so all of Julie's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and value uh, selling associates. So thrilled, thrilled to talk to you. And thanks for the opportunity. So I'm Julie Thomas. I'm with Value Selling. If you want to learn more, I'm not hard to find. Find me on LinkedIn. Find me on ValueSelling.com. And if you're a reader, this Ooh. is coming up uh, next week in September, September 20th being published. Uh, pick up your copy of Value Selling and uh, let me know what your feedback is. Yeah, and we'll have a link to the book uh, below the video. So congratulations on the book. Uh, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, Thank you John. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and it's great, great to have a neighbor on here, a neighbor, a neighbor yes. in Carlsbad. So thank you again, Julie. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Yeah.